This is Libertarian Viewpoint, and I'm your host, Sue Jeffers. We have all heard the constant drum roll of government solutions. The purpose of this show is to present you, the viewer, the non-government solution. Knowing non-government solutions will help you to ask more informed questions when talking with government officials. Libertarianism is all about liberty. Liberty is the exercise of freedom that doesn't impinge on the rights of others. It isn't hard to see how anyone could be against liberty. All non-government solutions are based, based on liberty. Today, you're lucky to get, to get to know the guest that I have in studio with me today. Tyler James Slinger is brave man that he is, is running for City Council of St. Paul. Welcome. Thank you so much. And first, I, I got to ask you, St. Paul the, it is a liberal bastion. They have elected Democrats for what, the last 40 years maybe? Absolutely. And you, I, I ask people, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and again and expecting a different result. So we need to see some new faces. We need to see some new energy. We need to have some new ideas for the city of St. Paul. And you're our guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. The uh, city of St. Paul in 2007 uh, voted to implement instant runoff voting because they clearly want more competition in their elections. They want more political speakers, uh, like I said, more political competition between candidates. And they simply don't want uh, the two-party system to be in place there. So I've decided to toss my hat in the ring and absolutely step forward. I'm you know, currently dissatisfied with a lot of what the city's doing regarding budgeting. Uh, anybody who lived in uh, St. Paul this winter knows for a fact that they absolutely didn't budget enough to shovel the snow off of our streets as well as just the uh, the way that the city council handles its hearings and dealing with individuals on a community basis, it simply doesn't do it in an effective manner. Uh, specifically, I think what really galvanized me to run is I went and I watched the city council meeting and I saw an individual plead with the city council not to condemn the top half of his house because it was in breach of a single, a single fire code that uh, said he had to have a specific amount of height on the second floor. Well, they turned his two bedroom, one bathroom house into a one bedroom. And he's renting this out, obviously, to two other individuals, a mother and a son, who were living there. And they basically, essentially, if those individuals didn't leave or he didn't find a new renter, they created three criminals in the city of St. Paul, obviously over a stupid rule, over a rule that could have been, uh, he pleaded with them to give him an exemption. And they didn't, they didn't even really discuss it. The two minutes of discussion between the city councilmen and, and women, uh, Kathy Lantry, and they were done. And I think that's unacceptable. I think we need to do better for the people of St. Paul, and I think we can do better. I know we can do better. Absolutely. I'm really excited that you're running. Thank you. Let, let's run down some of the lists of things that concern the voters in St. Paul. And let's start at the very top with, um, you, you mentioned IRV, you, you instant runoff voting. And you mentioned that, that there, the two-party system doesn't work in St. Paul. That's clear. Absolutely. So you can have a multitude of candidates. And, and I say the more the merrier, bring them on. But they did something nasty. And they increased the the fee for what it what it takes to become a candidate. Do you want to talk Absolutely, about that? Absolutely, yeah, most certainly. Uh, back in March, uh, City Council, by their own edict, by their own decree, their own ordinance, increased the fee to run. And generally, it's fifty dollars for a City Council and a mayoral race to get your name on the ballot. That's all it does. Uh, you know, you don't get any extra spending uh, or any money like they do on the state level, federal level, that sort of thing. What it does is simply get your name on the ballot. Well, what they did is they increased it five hundred percent. And they increased it to $250. And then in the instance of mayor, it's up to $500 simply to get on there. Absolutely. It's ridiculous. It's, uh, it's absolutely an incumbent protection program with the, uh, with the intention of cutting out people who aren't as financially able to get on the ballot. And these city council races are run for relatively low dollar amounts. So $250 is a lot out of somebody's pocket. And they're, they're basically their argument for it is, well, you can do a petition. Well, getting 500 names is as, as tedious as going out there and spending $250. It's clearly an incumbent protection program. It's not going to pay for the election. If you have three or four or even 10 candidates, that's $2,500. It's not going to pay for the election. That's, that's what they did in March. And now there's no primary. And basically, people, people weren't even aware of it. One person spoke on the ordinance, only one. 
Wow, that is unbelievable. I just want to just say this. Do you know how much it costs to run for city council in the city I live? I don't Five dollars. <laughs> no way. Five dollars is what it takes to get your name on the ballot. And to have St. Paul raise it up to $250 is outrageous. Absolutely. There should be a lawsuit against that. I hope somebody does file suit against the city. I mean, talk about government overreach. That is, you're exactly right. It's incumbent protection. That's what it is. Oh, crazy. Okay. So the next crazy thing in St. Paul is their budget. Yes. What is their budget? Their budget is, I'm trying to think of the, the total dollar amount. Well, one of the things as I'm digging into the budget, not only do they have a general budget, they have a special budget, they have a library budget, they have a uh, housing and development association budget, and these are all separate entities. So if you're trying to figure out how much they actually spend on a yearly basis, it's hard because you have to put in the general budget, the special, uh, special allocation budget, and they're spending, uh, I believe it's somewhere around $500 million. It might be a little bit over, like closer to $600 million. Uh, and that goes for police protection, fire protection, roads, parks, rec centers, libraries, everything like that. And their operating budget over the last, uh, since 2005, so over the last six years, has increased 20% if you account for inflation. So that's not just, you know, the cost of living of their employees, that sort of thing. That's base dollars increase in spending, 20%, one-fifth increase. Uh, in addition to that, the debt service, they've had to pay more on their debt because they've taken on all this extra debt with, you know, the projects that they're doing, the loft projects, obviously, the light rail project, all different sorts oh, of... Oh, don't get me started on no, light we rail trans. We'll save that for a little later. In absolutely. The show. So, no, the, the budget is... It's extraordinary, and nobody nobody seems to hold them accountable. You can't really, like I said earlier about the hearings, nobody wants to talk about the issues. They don't even acknowledge you when you're there. They talk between each other. They don't even acknowledge the petitioner when you show up. So there's there's a lot of problems, and a lot of it's based on property taxes. Like they they finance it through taxation. So if they do take on they do bonding or they take on uh, more debt through interest or loans, it all comes down to taxation. Taxation is their revenue, and it comes from property taxes, which is fundamentally regressive. It hurts the poor, it hurts the uh, the elderly, it hurts the young, it hurts all those individuals. But it makes sense to use property taxes for specific things like fire protection and things like that. But they're overreaching arms into parks, uh, libraries, and things like that. Uh, when, I, when I was looking into it, uh, between the park and recreational, the Como Zoo, all that sort of stuff, they basically are one of the largest entertainment providers in St. Paul. They provide the most entertainment opportunity through rental or leasing of the, the books and videos at the library, as well as parks and recreational, and they aren't even actually trying to market it like a business would. They're simply just having it there, and people can come and show up and not really pay anything. It's, it's, it's a lot of free riders, a lot of free rider problems that are happening. So the city can do better, like I said. Uh, which I find it so refreshing that you can actually talk about different parts of the budget and where some of the money is spent. There are so many candidates that get out there when they're running for something, they have no idea what they're involved with. An, an additional to the, to the budget is that uh, with public safety and things like that, they've basically uh, decided that they're going to take a little bit off of each uh, in every part of the budget when they do try to implement cuts, so to speak, even though they're increasing cuts. taxes, absolutely, with air quotes there for sure. <laughs> um, and they take it right from the public safety budget, and that's what they always threaten with. It, when LGA gets cut, it's going to be police and firefighters and our roads that are going to suffer, and that simply doesn't have to be the case. That simply isn't what uh, a lot of the money that uh, they spend goes to. And I, I was reading on their website and just kind of following through the, the uh, I guess, the, what property taxes cost. And I'll just give you a, a small example of what we pay in property taxes and where it kind of goes. So the average sale of a house nowadays in St. Paul, with the market being it as it is, is about $185,000 a year, which in property taxes, uh, they take out, it's, I think it's a little over $2,000 for that amount. And then what happens is, if you break it down to police and fire and roads, is you pay 47 cents a day for your fire or for your police protection, about a little over 22 cents a day for your fire protection, and that seems reasonable for those services. But where is all this extra money? Last year they had to increase the levy. The year before they had to increase the levy. Where is all this extra money going? Uh, and we can talk about, I guess, about public safety in a little bit. But one of the main concerns I have is that with the LGA cuts that the uh, the local legislator uh, has been legislature has been putting into effect, which I find completely reasonable, because uh, especially on LGA, 20% of the state, but 1 million people pay into LGA but don't get any of the funds. And I think I think that's ridiculous. And I think that Mayor Coleman and other constituents in the area realize this that LGA couldn't go on forever. You know, it was a cash cow. It was great to have for as many years as we did have it but it couldn't go on indefinitely because a million people 
are basically getting fleeced by the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And if the if you keep to its core constituency of what it was supposed to do, which is to help uh, communities which were don't have a proper tax base, that's not St. Paul. St. Paul is the second biggest city in the entire state. We have a sufficient property tax base to go about it. And the other issue with that is that St. Paul received a disproportionate uh, portion of the LGA. We have about five and a half percent of the state's population and we have about, we're receiving about 11 percent of the aid, so about twice as much as a percentage. And if you combine Minneapolis and St. Paul, the Twin Cities, we're up to 25 percent between the two cities that are in, when you're, uh, uh, for the entire state of the entire LGA budget. So it simply couldn't happen.